it's a real honor to have you here today. And of course, Xavier, you're here. Thank you for your part in all of this. Um, uh, I forgot to mention in the beginning, we are gonna hold uh, questions and answers until the end, if that's okay, because we just wanna keep the flow starting. And you can also write some down and send it to me or, or Frida or Grace or, or Maya, if you're listening from Canada. Um, so next up, we have uh, Grace uh, Kwan. Uh, joining us from Canada. Grace is the CEO of Hydrogen in Motion. So take it away, Grace. Thank you. You're muted, Grace. Is there ever a meeting that you don't have uh, someone muted? <laughs> Just bear with me for a moment. I'll share my screen. Here we go. Okay, so I'm uh, Grace Kwan, President and CEO of a company called Hydrogen in Motion. We have developed a nanomaterial that uh, stores hydrogen under low pressure. So it's, um, it's an innovation in solid state hydrogen stor storage. And the reason we've done this is because um, hydrogen, uh, the whole industry is being held back right now uh, because of the technical uh, challenges involved in storage and transport of hydrogen. So um, there's not too many hydrogen stations um, in the world. Uh, in 2021, there was only 668 hydrogen stations versus 168,000 in the U.S. alone. Uh, they're very expensive. They're about $2 million U.S. each, and they have very high cop uh, capital operating costs. Um, due to the compressors and chillers. So if you look at the right, the, the cycle is, um, is delivered typically by uh, liquid um, storage. It can also be delivered as gas, but then you have to compress it uh, using a four stage compressor and then you dispense it with a chiller. So these, this type of equipment is quite costly and um, to buy and costly to operate. Also, uh, just hydrogen storage itself is about 30 times the cost of a conventional gas tank. So a gas tank in your vehicle right now is probably about 200 US dollars. A hydrogen tank is anywhere between five and 7,000 US dollars. Very high pressure at 700 bar or 10,000 pounds per square inch. So that makes the economic feasibility um, of transporting hydrogen for any distance um, uh, very not feasible or very high cost. Uh, the University of um, Calgary, a, uh, Dr. David Lazelle did a um, study on the cost of generation, which is the first block, the cost of transport, which is the second block, and the cost of dispensing, which is the third block. And together, you'll see that um, for a price at the pump at twelve fifty, hydrogen production it represents maybe um, anywhere between uh, ten to uh, thirty percent but the transport and dispensing costs represent uh, 70%. So if hydrogen motion technology can bring down the cost by 25 to 30% because we have a, a solid state transport, it's much cheaper and you can dispense at uh, low pressure, which also uh, takes a massive amount of price out of the equation. So what have we got? We have um, made a nanomaterial that um, hydrogen is attracted to the surface using um, fizzy sorption or Van der Waals force. We never, um, unlike other uh, metal hydrides, we do not uh, split the metal, uh, the hydrogen atom. So it, it's a hydrogen molecule, I mean, it also remains H2, and that makes it easier to um, get on and off the material. So um, we are comparable the the highest tanks, best tanks in the markets, which are 700 bar tanks, uh, but with lower pressure, with a smaller footprint, and um, uh, our our tanks are conformable to different sizes and shapes. Uh, they are um, uh, cheaper, much cheaper, and uh, technically a lot less challenging to refuel and to uh, transport just a visual of uh, our size difference. So uh, H2M tank is on the left. The um, uh, uh, 700 bar tank is the center one and a 350 bar tank is the one on the right. So you can see visually that it is at least a third smaller, if not half the size of a conventional tank. So we make um, 
this uh, cost competitive to um, to gasoline. So if you look at the first column as standard gasoline, uh, animal fuel cost at um, at uh, twelve fifty. Uh, oh no, a dollar fifty six a liter is twenty five hundred dollars. So um, to the hybrid, of course, is is much cheaper at around fifteen hundred dollars. Battery electric, it's at, if it's uh, depending on your cost of electricity at fifteen cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, we're assuming for the same distance is five hundred eighty eight, but then the downfall, of course, is time to charge. And then hydrogen fuel cell vehicle is about equivalent at twelve fifty a kilogram. Uh, of course, that's going up in price. Uh, H2M makes it even cheaper than operating conventional vehicle. So our value proposition is uh, relatively simple. We can help you bring down the costs or uh, expand the uh, marketplace and bring up revenue. So the distribution, we can effectively transport and distribute hydrogen. We can use, uh, of course, you need a tank for all fuel cell applications. So whether it be uh, automotive, 24% uh, of GHGs are from transportation. Aerospace, uh, the UAV drone market is worth $127 billion. Um, or you can do energy storage. So uh, excess um, solar or wind or wave energy can be stored as hydrogen and shipped out as hydrogen. So HGM technology is key to unlocking the hydrogen supply chain. And we have, um, as I said, we can increase your revenue uh, by expanding your markets or decrease your costs by um, uh, decreasing cost, capital cost of storage and the operating cost of storage. I'll leave it at that due, due to our uh, time limitations and uh, uh, I hope to hear some questions at the end. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Grace, really interesting. Uh, up next is uh, Clara Phillips from Canada. Clara is the technical project lead with Nunavut Nukik Sautit. I hope I said that correctly. Corporation. All right. Can everyone screen, see my screen good? Perfect. So hi everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Clara, and like I was just introduced, I'm the technical project lead with Nunavut Nukik Sautik Corporation. And today I'm going to be talking to you about renewable energy in the Arctic and how Nunavut and Iceland fit into that. So first I'll give you a bit of background on NNC. So we are Nunavut's first 100% Inuit owned renewable energy company. And our mission is to lead the Kikatani region's energy transition by partnering with communities to develop clean energy solutions. So for anyone who may not know, Nunavut is the largest and most northerly territory in the Canadian Arctic. However, even with its size, it is very sparsely populated and completely disconnected from the rest of Canada. There's no roads in or out and no connection to the North American elect electricity grid. And although Nunavut has such a large and beautiful, diverse landscape with an abundance of natural resources, there's one ugly thing that is in each community these things, tank farms. So this slide shows 15 of the 25 tank farms located in the territory, and they exist because Nunavut is 100% reliant on diesel for electricity and heat. So each year the government purchases about 200 million liters of diesel and ships it up to every community each summer. And this diesel is then stored in the tank farms. Then the utility purchases about one quarter of this diesel, burns that diesel, and distributes it to customers all over the territory. Uh, and while there are government subsidies, Nunavumi would still pay some of the highest electricity rates in the country at a min minimum of 31 cents per kilowatt hour, up to 94 cents. And this money does not go back into the local economy. It's just simply funneled back out into the, the global oil market. And this is the cycle that's been happening for the past 75 years. However, at NNC, we have another vision, and the future of energy in Nunavut can look very different with the integration of renewables. With all the resources that we have in Nunavut, we can generate our own clean and cheap power, 
And this will not only benefit the environment, but also enable the diversification of the company of the economy. And most importantly, put money back in the pockets of Nunavut. So is this future state possible for Nunavut? Yes. And in fact, it has been done elsewhere in, Ar in the Arctic. So Iceland, a place similar, a place isolated from the rest of the world, similar to Nunavut, gets 100% of its electricity from renewable energy sources. However, this was not always the case. And it was up until the 70s that Iceland was still very much reliant on imported fossil fuels for electricity generation. However, as the price of oil skyrocketed in the 70s, Icelanders began to realize that it was unsustainable to rely on fossil fuel imports and began looking for alternative solutions for electricity and heat production. So as a result of the, an abundance of natural resources available in Iceland, they were able to significantly scale up their renewable energy, energy production to the point where they are now almost 100% reliant on renewables for electricity and heat. And this mostly comes from hydro and geothermal generation. So access to cheap electrical and thermal, thermal energy has allowed several, several energy intensive industries to thrive in, in the country to ec economic growth. So how did Iceland do this? And how did they do it in such a short period of time? So evidently, Iceland has an abundance of natural resources that does make enabling renewables easier. However, lots of countries have this and still have not completely been able to phase out fossil fuels. So from the start of Iceland's transition, there was strong leadership from all levels of government in collaboration with communities in the early stages. And this helped foster trust and collect collectively come up with solutions for implementing renewables in a way that everybody was happy with. A strong legal and regulatory framework was also essential in Iceland's success. Policies and incentives from the Icelandic government broke down barriers and promoted the development of renewables with the goal to diversify the economy, create jobs, and establish a nationwide power grid. The Icelandic government also established Landsverken, the National Power Company of Iceland, at the start of the energy transition in 1965. And Landsverken operates hydro, geothermal, and wind stations in Iceland and have been a key entity in building Iceland's renewable power systems and industrializing the country. And with, and with over 50 years of experience in building and operating renewable assets, other countries look to Landsberg and for guidance on how to go about their own transition. And us, as Nunavut looks to transition away from fossil fuels, learning from our Arctic neighbor, neighbors has been a priority for NNC. As such, in 2019, NNC began discussions with Landsberg and Power through an existing relationship with Growler Energy. And as a relatively new organization at the time, NNC wanted to identify partners with whom we could grow, learn, and develop renewable energy project, projects with in Nunavut. So in 2020, Landsberg and Growler and NNC signed an MOU to collaborate on renewable energy projects in the region. And our most notable project is our pro wind project in Sandy Kilowack. So the Anarikshuak Nukik Soti project, which means big wind in English, is a one megawatt wind turbine combined with one megawatt of battery energy storage. And this system is located on a small island of Sandy Kilowack in the southern part of the Hudson's Bay with a population of about 800. So this is the first community scale project in Nunavut and is targeting at least a 50% reduction in diesel consumption for electricity in the community. And so far, this project has been a trailblazer in the territory and has hit many historic milestones, including the first ever energy purchase agreement in the territory. So we began road construction to the wind turbine back in the fall of 2023, and then we plan to install the turbine next year. So since 2020, we have formalized our partnership on the project with between NNC, Landsberg, and, and Growler, and we're also working on a number, a number of other projects together, including a 15 megawatt hydropower project in Akalit, which is Nunavut's capital city. 
So identifying experienced partners has proven to be immensely successful for the projects that NNC is working on uh, for many reasons. So firstly, at the start of our partnership in 2020, NNC was leading political advocacy for new renewables in Nunavut and being, uh, having, being connected with such a well-established organization in Iceland, we were able to establish greater trust with politicians, um, the utility to reassure Nunavut the viability both technically and economically of renewables in the Arctic. And as NNC starts to deploy our own renewable assets, it only makes sense for us to align with an organization that has such a big portfolio of assets already, as this will help us as we seek investment partners for future projects. And finally, being able to lean on the experience of our Icelandic partners as we develop projects has been completely invaluable. Um, they've not only provided technical expertise, but have proven over the years to be commercially prudent and extremely knowledgeable in Arctic logistics. And we work pretty, we work really well together given the expertise they bring to the partnership, allowing us to focus on strong community engagement practices to ensure a successful Inuit-led clean energy transition in Nunavut. So with all that being said, I'll close my presentation by just emphasizing the importance and value of international collaboration and connections, especially in the Arctic. There's only a small number of places in the world that understand the challenges and barriers of living in the Arctic, and we need to continue to lean on each other and make change and work towards a more sustainable future together. So Kranami, and thank you so much for listening. so much, Clara. It's, it's an incredibly interesting um, lecture for you and uh, well done on reducing the burning of the diesel. That's our main goal in everything we try to do. So well done. Um, well, next up we have uh, Denise Pothier, uh, who is the Chief Operating Officer at the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. If you're ready, Denise. Thank you. I don't have a presentation to share. It'll just be, be me. So thank you so much for including me um, in your meeting today. I am based in Jibuktuk in Halifax, Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada. And I'd really like to uh, thank my colleagues, Clara and Grace for their presentations. Um, you spoke with such passion and shared so many insights um, tough acts to follow. Um, and certainly thank you to WIRE um, and the Embassy of Canada to Iceland and FKA um, for this opportunity for collaborative learning and discussion. From my perspective, it's so important that we create these spaces for us all to think, to reflect, gather our thoughts and feelings, and do it intentionally um, while keeping our hearts and conversations open about the past but considering these opportunities for the future. So I'd like to share with you a little bit of information about the work we do at the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business or CCAB. So the focus of my talk will be more on the equity side of things as opposed to the technical side of things and, and hopefully round out the discussions that we've had today. So what we do at the CCAB is build bridges between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, businesses and communities, through programming, providing tools, training, network building, major business awards, as well as national events. And um, it was created nearly 40 years ago by Murray Koffler. And much like you are sharing a very special anniversary today, next month in May, we will be sharing our 40th anniversary. So really proud. Um, of those decades of work and looking forward to the decades to come. We are a Canadian national not-for-profit member-based organization. We are nonpartisan. We do not receive core funding um, from, from government. And we currently have over 2,500 members who are, are part of our association. And the key programs and services that we offer um, our progressive Aboriginal relations, which I will spend um, the bulk of the presentation talking about, certified Aboriginal businesses. We have a TFAB program, which is tools and financing for Aboriginal businesses. We have an Aboriginal or Indigenous procurement marketplace. 
We do research, policy setting, lobbying. We do an Aboriginal business report and we do have our awards and national events to highlight the successes of, of individ, Indigenous individuals, companies and uh, communities. So essentially, uh, our focus is that corporations, investors and Canadians um, do stand to benefit by partnering, procuring from and investing in Indigenous businesses. And when consumers and corporations recognize the importance of a thriving Indigenous business and enterprises, it creates those sustainable economic opportunities for Indigenous business, in, Indigenous businesses and peoples. And when Indigenous people do well, Canada also benefits and also does well. So with Indigenous people being the youngest and fastest growing demographic in Canada, it also means that the purchasing power of Indigenous people increases as employment and entrepreneurship continue to rise. And today we see a number of organizations that are building a RAP or Reconciliation Action Plan or an Indigenous Inclusion Strategy. And many are doing so with the help of our PAR program, Progressive Aboriginal Relations that I mentioned earlier. And PAR is considered, is considered to be Canada's premier corporate social responsibility program with respect to Indigenous relations. PAR is a certification program, a guide and a tool that makes um, that will take corporations through a journey from an assessment of their current level or commitment to engaging or having relations with Indigenous peoples and then building a strategic plan to to implement these you know policies and practices that they would have to build those relations with indigenous businesses and there are four key drivers to um the par program and the first one which we saw in clara's presentation starts with leadership and leadership actions actions that reinforce the organization's focus on building those indigenous relations and that starts from the top of the organization down throughout the organization. Setting a clear commitment and policy and identifying and communicating that organization's um, interest in working with Indigenous businesses and peoples and communities. The second pillar is around employment. Is there targeted recruitment? Is there cultural awareness training within the organization? Are there employee network groups so that Indigenous peoples feel welcome within the organization? And what are those advancement opportunities that are focused on the Indigenous employees? And then the third is community relations. How is the organization establishing long-term mutually beneficial relationships with Indigenous communities and peoples? And are we taking, and are those businesses taking the time to get to know the community? And are we fostering that inclusive culture and making those meaningful connections? And acknowledging that sometimes this will take years to accomplish. And then we look at the business development side of things, the fourth pillar, those partnering opportunities, the supply chain networks, um, and in this area, we look at um, both the engagement and support for Indigenous peoples and Indigenous businesses. So within this business development pillar, I'm going to focus a little bit on procurement. And through um, the evidence that is available, our own research, and in discussions directly with Indigenous communities, um, and specifically Indigenous communities in other countries, we launched Supply Change. Um, and that created an, an unprecedented national approach to Indigenous procurement, and it developed the largest membership of corporations committed to increasing Indigenous participation in corporate supply chains and connecting them with certified Aboriginal businesses through this procurement marketplace. And we have seen corporations across Canada making and delivering on commitments to Indigenous procurement and the real impact that that can have. In 2018, CERNAC and ISC, the Indigenous Services, um, uh, Indigenous Services Canada, my apologies, 
supported the CCAB to undertake an in-depth data study to better understand Indigenous capacity to meet federal supply chains. And we worked with Big River Analytics, which is an Indigenous um, company, and produced a comparative analysis of federal procurement demands and Indigenous business supply in Canada. And we found that the existing Indigenous businesses in Canada could meet close to a quarter or 24% of the current federal government's procurement. So we are working very closely with the federal government to implement the recent commitment to increase their procurement spend um, for Indigenous businesses to 5% of their spend. And that equates um, closely to the Indigenous population of Canada. So that alone would bring close to $1 billion into the Indigenous economy in Canada. And we cannot um, as well, we cannot deny the impact that private sector procurement has had on Indigenous communities and the ripple effect that it creates in rebuilding intergenerational wealth. And our work will not be done until Indigenous businesses and Indigenous communities are given the opportunity to take meaningful steps forward and keep pace, and keeping pace locally, nationally, and globally. Will Allen, thank you. Merci. Thank you, Denise. Uh, now to start off with our Icelandic speakers, uh, we will start with our very own Fita Polite. Fita is the um, founder and CEO of uh, Geosilaga Iceland. She is also the chairman of EPCA Sudanes and one of its founders. Her topic today is from heat to wealth extracting valuable minerals from geothermal byproducts. Thank you. Hello, everybody here and online. Uh, I want to start by thanking our, uh, the presenters from Canada, Grace, uh, Denise, and Clara. Thank you, Clara, for a good uh, presentation on Iceland. It's, uh, it's really, it was really a good one. So thank you all, and I will uh, carry on talking about the green energy focusing on the geothermal energy. So we are all uh, looking into clean tech, but clean tech revolution cannot start without clean mining. So my name is Fida Abulibde, and I'm the CEO and founder of Geosilica. I'm energy engineer from the University of Iceland. I also have a MBA degree from the University of Reykjavik. So Clara went into this, the availability of geothermal energy here in Iceland, but I will a little bit more um, Diving into the geothermal, ge geothermal energy, we have around uh, 250 low temperature geothermal areas and, uh, uh, and around 30 high temperature. We are utilizing uh, five high temperature geothermal areas here in Iceland. We use the steam for the production of the electricity and then when the steam cools down, we use the uh, hot water and the, color, uh, the steam for various industry like drying, uh, sw uh, district heating, swimming pools, uh, and uh, a lot of other uh, low temperature uh, uh, industries. But the highest value that we could get from the geothermal fluids is by mining minerals. And uh, we know that from the geothermal energy uh, fluids, at that deep, at this hot, we will have, uh, scientists say, we have the whole periodic table coming up from that de the depth. So we have very valuable minerals, minerals in the geothermal water, and mostly here in Iceland, we have the silica. We have around 600 to 800 ppm of silica in the geothermal water. But it's actually a problem for the geothermal power plants. It's causing the silica scaling problem. We cannot utilize all the heat. Uh, yeah, it's a problem, and we call it just waste. Um, so, and it's not only a problem for the geothermal uh, power plants or geothermal energy, it's a problem for the whole world because we cannot extract the silica from the geothermal water, uh, so we have to produce it from other sources like industrial source. And the way we are producing silica today is causing 10% uh, of the world pollution. So we are using very dirty industry for extracting minerals from other sources than geothermal. Well, I have a solution. I have a solution for clean mining minerals. 
We at Geostelica, we have developed methods to extract minerals from the geothermal water and produce very valuable raw material. The product, our silica is carbon neutral and increase the sustainability of the geothermal uh, power plants by extracting the silica, avoiding the silica scaling problem. We are upcycling the waste, which we call uh, the cold water, waste water, containing that high amount of silica. And then we are producing high, uh, we are uh, producing valuable products from the silica. So we are the first company in the world naturally mining geosilica, uh, geothermal silica. We have a geostep technology. We call our technology geostep. It's a four-step technology. Start with a, a very close cooperation with the geothermal power plants, where they do the drilling and the separating of the steam from the, from the water. And then we come in, we concentrate the, sil the silica amount in the water, and then we purify it from heavy metals. We source it 100% naturally and uh, ready for food-graded silica. So we are creating uh, value from the silica, and, and silica is a mineral which is uh, used in food industry as anti-caking agent. It's used in food supplements. It's used in pharmaceutical. pharmaceutical. It's good for plants, used as fertilizer and uh, biostimulant. It's an uh, ingredient in cosmetics and used in glass, solar cells, in any uh, computer chips. It's all over the place. So what is silica that Fida is talking about? Silica is the most ama abundant mineral in earth crust, and it's essential for uh, trace mineral for human body also. So it's a key ingredient in our body for production of uh, collagen, both type 1 and 2 in skin and in bones. We are born with over seven grams of silica in our body, so it's the second after the iron, and it's found in our bones, hair, skin, and nails. Why silica? Uh, our body does not produce silica, and we do not get enough silica from our dietary. So the, the nutrition in our food has decreased by 38% 38, 38 since 1950, and we are not getting enough of silica. And with, with AIDS, the silica amount declines in the body. So if it's not in, we cannot produce it, it's not in our food, where do we get it from? Okay, we can use it from a natural resource. So geosilica is offering 100% natural silica with no added chemicals, just concentrated and purified. We have five products on the market. We have the pure silica, silica for joint and bones with manganese, and then we have for hair, skin, and nails with uh, zinc and copper. We have uh, for muscles and nerves with, um, with magnesium. And then we have for mind and energy with iron and vitamin D. All of our products are vegan certified and GMP produced and bottled and contain 100% silic uh, silica. Uh, we are built on innovation and uh, fulfilled by person up until we established the company as a spin-off from the University of Iceland in 2012, and up until 2019, uh, we financed the company just by grants and our own uh, uh, money. Uh, but uh, in 2019, we got shareholders in the company, and it was the first time in the history of Iceland that the pension fund, the, the engineering pension fund, comes directly in a startup, and that was at GeoSilicon. So we are selling our products all over the world, uh, mainly in Europe, and uh, we started, recently started in North America through uh, KEHI and Walmart. Uh, we, it's not complicated, it's very easy. We started where we are, we used what we had, and we did what we can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fida. Um, next up, we have from the Icelandic panel, Lilia Magnusdóttir, Head of Research Management at Hauis Orka, and she will be talking about Hauis Orka vital steps towards a greener future, the overview of Hauis Orka's initiatives and projects focused on sustainability energy development. Good afternoon. 
Before I go into HS Orca's projects and the resource management team and our vital steps towards a greener future, I'll um, introduce myself. So my background is in mechanical engineering. I did my master's at the University of Iceland, and then I did a PhD at Stanford in energy resources engineering. And there I focused on geothermal energy and using computational models to optimize geothermal production. And then I did a postdoc at Berkeley Lab in California, and there I developed a module for flow simulator ITUF2 that makes it possible to simulate supercritical conditions. What that means is that you can estimate what's happening at the deep roots of geothermal systems. And uh, Berkeley Lab is, is currently selling that module. And then I worked as, uh, in solar panel development at Tesla as a senior development engineer. And there I got to experience a very fast and innovative environment where things happen very quickly and uh, there were patents for all the ideas and, and even one of my design had a patent. And after that I got funding to do some research at the University of Iceland. I always wanted to test out the method I developed during my PhD of estimating fracture connectivity in geothermal reservoirs using resistivity. And I got to dive also into artificial intelligence uh, for the data analysis and I got to do this experiment at one of HS Orca's uh, reservoir at Reykjanes. I was still living in California where I did my studies, so I would fly back here for the experiment. And after 11 years in California, I moved to Iceland in 2020. I started working for HS Orca, where I'm now the head of research management. For those who are not familiar with geothermal energy, Iceland is located at the boundary of the North American plate and the Eurasian plate. And those are separating, so that's why we have all this volcanic activity. Iceland is also underlain by a hot spot, uh, this plume of hotter, denser material from the Earth's mantle, uh, which causes more eruptions. And we need that for the geothermal energy. And this is believed to have caused the formation of Iceland 16 to 18 million years ago. And in Iceland, geothermal resources are divided into two categories, the low temperature resources and then the high temperature resources that we see here, which we use for the electric city production and hot water. And HS Orca is the largest privately owned power producer in Iceland, and it's Iceland's third largest energy producer. We have about 260 megawatts of uh, electrical production capacity. You can see there our geothermal plants and uh, our hydro plants. And then we sell some uh, more energy from smaller plants as well. And from the start, we have been utilizing the multiple streams from our resource, uh, because when we have used the heat for our production, we can still use the water and minerals, like Theta talked about, and uh, gases uh, further. We have two, and then we have hydro plants at Bru and Fjarðará that are almost uh, 20 megawatts total in electricity production. And if we look at our human resources, we have 87 employees and 80% of those are men. And the reason for that is that a lot of our jobs are um, mechanics that are working on the operation and maintenance of our plants. And we don't get many women applying for those jobs. So it's a bit difficult to change that percentage. We would need more women to choose to become mechanics, for example. But our board of directors has 50% uh, men and 50% women. And our executive board has seven people and there are 43% women. And I'm leading an amazing team, the resource management team, where we have uh, we're a total of eight people. Well, Hannah, she starts uh, this summer. And there we have project managers, uh, Alma and Valdis, and we have Kate, the geoscientist. Then we have geochemist, Kiflom and William, and uh, Laurus is the chief reservoir engineer, and Hannah will join as a reservoir engineer. And in our team, with me included, we are 63% women. And we are responsible for monitoring and managing the resource. So we've developed reservoir models, conceptual models. We are monitoring the 
operation and the research, uh, taking chemical samples from the wells. We are measuring, you know, everything we can measure. We have pressure and temperature, and then we use this in our models to optimize the production and ensuring sustainable use of the resource. We also evaluate the need for drilling new boreholes for injection or production and uh, where they are to be drilled. And then uh, we do the cutting analysis in-house and we monitor the drilling. And we have also been monitoring a volcano since November and there have been four volcanic eruptions and it's Amazing to say that our production has been almost interrupted and we are protected by these embankments that you can see in the photo here at the bottom uh, from the lava and, and there is not believed to be any danger really of uh, lava getting um, towards the plant. So we have just increased our monitoring of the pressures in the boreholes because we see an increase in pressure before any of the eruptions. And then we looked at the pH measurements in the beginning. We didn't see any changes there. We have been monitoring the gases. We see some gases in our boreholes and also the gas pollution from the volcano so we can take appropriate measures. And then we have regular meetings with the meteorological office a few times a week usually where we go over all the data and analyze and we always have the, a good uh, idea of what the current status is in regards to the volcano. And I mentioned that we have been seeing this pressure increase before the eruptions. Uh, first, when it happened in uh, November, uh, we saw this big increase in pressure, and then it happened again in December. Uh, this can be 30 minutes, 20 minutes before, or a few hours. And I said to uh, some people on the team, you know, we need to use this, we need to make some kind of warning system, because we know before everyone else that it's about to erupt, you know. And the team executed this perfectly and, and made a system that sends a message to the meteorological office. Uh, when we get that signal, they have used this and, and uh, it has worked very well because their system of earthquake monitors and the GPS monitors, if it's very windy, you will get a lot of noise and they might not be able to see any signal. So in that case, this might be the only warning that they get. And we were able to get this done quickly because we had already developed a database in-house where we have almost a real-time status of the geothermal system that helps us monitor it effectively. And we've put a lot of emphasis on reservoir modeling and really understanding the reservoir. We have, uh, for example, increased uh, the injection at Reykjavnes to uh, increase the pressure in the system. And then we have linked production models to our reservoir models to get a really good understanding of what the production capacity is. Uh, some of our wells are fluctuating in how much they produce, and we use artificial intelligence to learn that pattern so we can give the sales team a better idea of how much we're producing at each time. And then, uh, shortly after the volcanic activity started, we also started drilling two new wells. We have drilled one of them, and we are drilling another right now. The objective there is to distribute the uh, production uh, for the Reykjanes plant. And if the wells are not producers, we're gonna try to use them for injection to give pressure support for the uh, current reservoir. And uh, I think anyone who has been involved with drilling a geothermal well knows that a lot can happen and there's a lot of different solutions and they are drilling this 24 seven and uh, after you drill, you have to test the well and stimulate the well and the different ways of doing that. So you can expect a call at any time of day or night where you have to make the decision. And before at HS Orca, the people making that decision were, I think almost all of them were men who have now retired. So now we are getting the next generation of these specialists. And although we don't hesitate to look for guidance in those that have the experiment, experience, it's nice to say that the majority of the drilling team now are women. And then just quickly about the resource park, we have 10 companies in a resource park at Reykjanes. They use the streams from our production. And those are hot water, steam, electricity, cold water, uh, lava filtered seawater, uh, geothermal water, CO2, and uh, I will end with this slide. Uh, we 
use this. The companies are, for example, Blue Lagoon Spa and Hotels, the Northern Light Inn, uh, we have food, cosmetic, and biotech companies, uh, Carbon Recycling International, uh, Matorka, Stolt Sea Farm, and then there are projects planned, like Sam Harry is planning a land-based salmon farm. And we are very picky about which companies come into a research park. Our goal is that the uh, companies that are there might have waste for another company, so that, for example, if you have a food processing company, they might have waste that some other company could use. And the ultimate goal is to create a circular economy uh, for a greener future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lilla. And uh, it, it's so uh, interesting what you're doing at Taosorka and so innovative for, for Iceland and for the world. Um, now we have a right to our next speaker. It's Marta Rós Kallsdóttir. Uh, Marta is the Managing Director at Baseload Power Iceland. There you are. <laughs> she will be talking to us about the uh, insight into Baseload Power Iceland strategies for providing reliable green energy. Here you go, Marta. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for uh, these amazing speakers uh, that co came before me. I, I feel a little bit shy because I'm going to open up a little bit. I'm not going to be as technical as I'm used to. So I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, how it is to be uh, a woman in, in, in renewable energy sector. Uh, I know that we live in Iceland and we have so, you know, so many privileges and, and so uh, yeah, small challenges. But still, there are some pointers that I want to mention that I have uh, experienced and maybe uh, talk to you guys later on if you uh, if you know the feeling but um, yeah as uh, my talk is named from vision to action because I feel that throughout my career I have kind of strived to to realize a vision that I have and I have uh, had to kind of fight a little bit if, uh, for for making that happen so uh, and, and it's all always connected to sustainability and sustainable choices so I'm kind of navigating the male-dominated energy sector, you know, f focusing on big projects, focusing on economics, focusing on, you know, the technic technical parts. Uh, well, I see opportunities in, in making things a little bit better or, or a li little bit smarter choices, maybe new choices. So, uh, yeah, today I'm the Managing Director of Basel Power Iceland, and I want to just explain a little bit how I, how I got there. So um, go over my journey. I think I, I was like a typical girl, just uh, very polite, you know, did all of her assignments really well, really quiet, um, and just, yeah, just a hardworking girl. But I always wanted to, I, I felt I always wanted to define the stereotypes of, you know, how boys and girls are different, how they're kind of given different tasks and so on. So I, I always had that little, uh, rebellious feeling inside me without maybe really acting upon it, but, but I felt it's really clear. And also at a very young age, I was very fascinated uh, with renewable energy technologies uh, and technology as a whole. But also learning about, you know, what then was called the greenhouse, you know, greenhouse effect, now climate crisis. Uh, and seeing how renewable energies could play a big part in, in uh, battling that. Um, I also did a PhD here at the University of Iceland uh, in mechanical engineering, so I kind of obviously used those uh, interests that I had to, to go into mechanical engineering, focus on geothermal, and um, I actually managed to step or jump from a PhD student role to a management role. And I just want to mention why that happened, uh, which is so important because I was an unexperienced, uh, had no professional experience from, from the industry. I'd been working at the university teaching about geothermal, or studying geothermal, but I actually hadn't done anything you know, in the industry to, to make myself heard or known. But the advert for that role was so specific uh, on my talents but it did not require any experience. So I kind of ticked all the boxes. And of course I applied. I mean, this was my dream job. It's, you know, 
connected all of the fields that I had been working with, geothermal, sustainability, uh, and so on. So I, I applied and I was hired. Uh, and I sat for top management at On Power for eight years. And uh, I'm forever thankful for that opportunity because how they did that was so, so smart. Um, very quickly, uh, yeah, and then my journey. <laughs> So from this large energy corporation, I jumped over to um, engineering consultancy, then to public authorities, and now I'm heading a startup branch, tiny, tiny startup branch. So it's been a really exciting journey. Uh, so a little bit about my, my uh, company, Basedook Group. It's an international geothermal company uh, that has a mother company in Sweden, and they are uh, geniuses of finding investors that believe in in green technologies and geothermal projects. So they kind of make all of the co connections and make the projects in these different countries, uh, US, Iceland, Taiwan, and Japan, a uh, reality. So uh, focusing on what we do here in Iceland, we have, yeah, we have three projects. We have two projects in operation and one in development. And here's another thing uh, why I'm shy, <laughs> is because these projects are tiny. They are a thousand times smaller than the project I started with at OnPower. But still, uh, those were so excited, uh, exciting for me because they speak about communities and they speak about how we can you know, make projects, connecting the communities and serving communities on a small scale. So that's kind of, you know, that is uh, what I'm really proud of in my current role. Mm. But to the point that I wanted to share, it's kind of why I'm, I'm, I'm a bit shy. Mm. So <clears throat> I think my ideas have often been considered as naive or cute even, uh, but not good business. Um, and I have, have had to explain and fight and you know, really dig into the ideas that I want to push forward and m really make a stand to get them done. Uh, I get the advice to be, you know, more like this or more like that. Uh, I'm either too little or too, too, too uh, much. Uh, but I kind of have this good gut feeling and resilience uh, or even stubbornness to, to make, uh, you know, these kind of judgments or, or um, atmospheres uh, make me push even harder to realize, you know, what I think is so right to do. So, you know, being shy of, of, you know, going from a big company to a small startup with tiny projects, you know, looking into, okay, what are their value? Um, so we have a 0 0.3 megawatt project and a 0 0.6 megawatt project, and then, a, you know, developing a two megawatt project. But a single megawatt can actually produce enough power, or electricity to power 800 homes. And the locations that our power plants are, uh, are at, we don't even have 800 homes to supply. So, so it's so great to be able to create meaningful um, values for smaller communities with these projects. And another thing that uh, I'm really proud of is when I joined Baseload, I mean, I still came into this um, uh, yeah, atmosphere of, you know, economical feasibility, you know, building bigger, being stronger. But then again, uh, during conversations, we also managed to just, okay, we're really proud of what we're doing with the small scale projects. There's where the opportunity lies, there's our niche uh, that we can do really well and that we can do and replicate all over the world. So we started to say, okay, we're building heat and powerful communities. We're not building large power plants for industries, but we are building heat and power for communities. And that is our, that is our niche. And two examples uh, I wanna share uh, on, on challenges that I faced, but, but I am really proud uh, of, uh, of that, uh, what I accomplished. So in, at On Power, I, I, um, I managed a similar, uh, a team as, as uh, Lilia before me. And we uh, had to uh, make a big drilling contract for 10 to 15 wells to support uh, our power plant. 
And I said from the beginning, we, we have to drill with electricity. It's, it's, you know, it's so embarrassing to, to operate the geothermal power plant and drill with tons and tons of oil. So I, I started to voice that, and th people were like, no, we can't do that. There's only one drill in Iceland. It's abroad now, and we, we, you know, we can't be thinking about that. But then just pushing and pushing and pushing, uh, we got this through. So we made a 15 uh, well deal uh, to only drill with electricity. It didn't matter what it you know, took, uh, or it took longer than, than we had planned, but we did it. And I'm so proud of the, uh, the company, the drill rig. They say that the developer emphasized from the beginning to preserve the nature and use alternative approach powering the drill rig. So um, I'm really happy that uh, this someone was, was actually me and my team knowing what the right things to do was. Um, so my kind of message to you is don't, don't change yourselves, change the world you live in, and stay true to the, you know, to the gut feeling you have and, and, and be resilient. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marta, as before, really interesting. So uh, I'm gonna let Xavier come up here to address our ladies. Um, this is part of your program, so here you are, Xavier. Please come here. Thank you. Well, just thank you, everyone. My name is Xavier. I'm the Senior Trade Commissioner and Public Affairs Officer at the Embassy of Canada to Iceland. And we love just to support these events. And we are really pleased to have today FCOA and WIRE together. It's an honor and a privilege in my job. So I would say this is one of the best things I've done. It is not the best in my two years as a Senior Trade Commissioner. So, and I'm looking forward just to see you more cooperation between uh, Canada and Iceland, especially women-led co com uh, companies and enterprises. So, if you, um, now it would be the time for networking and events, and this is a networking event, and this meant to be like a, uh, like a, trying to be partnerships with Canada and Iceland and Iceland and Canada. So if you want to connect with any of the companies in Canada and any of the associations, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'm, uh, I'm at the EZ. We are only six at the embassy. And uh, so it's easy to find me. And, uh, in, and, and I'm really pleased just to connect you all and uh, to do and even more, go follow up this discussion. So I don't want to take more time from you because it's like a... I'm really honored just to be here with all of you. So it's like, uh, thank you very much, honestly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Xavier. We've been really good today with the timetable. I'm, I'm a bit shocked. So we're a bit ahead of schedule. We're waiting for our last uh, presenter who should be here any minute. But. Um, before she comes, I think we should go ahead with uh, Q&As, uh, questions and answers. So if you have any questions for our speakers, either the um, Icelandic ones or the Canadian ones, which are still with us, I believe. Now is the time. Do you want to talk about geothermal energy and silica or <laughs> not burning diesel? That's always a fun thing to do. All right. We have a we have a question in the Q and A on Zoom. Yeah. We can just load it up here on our screen. You can also, Maya, if you if you see yeah, it. Yeah, I can read it. You can yeah, read it so, for us. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Yeah. So Grace, uh, actually, you answered something as well. Maybe you want to take this one actually to the group. Grace Kwan. Yes. Um, so the question is, um, I have two questions. This is from Svetlana Bairozinkina. Uh, Sorry if I mangled your name. Um, I have two questions. What are the main issues with a green hydrogen usage, for instance, for Iceland and Canada case? And the second question is, does the energy infrastructure is ready for usage of green hydrogen since it needs multifunctional hubs to become useful? Thank you so much. 
So my response is uh, there to the two questions. One, um, what is the main issues with green hydrogen usage is all about um, the cost of energy generation. And then once you have the hydrogen, you need to transport it um, to the site where it's going to be used. So that, um, that missing middle of infrastructure, transport, distribution is, is um, uh, costly to put in. Hopefully with our tank system, uh, we'll be have swapping options, so it'll make that uh, transition a lot easier. But um, hydrogen uh, requires an infrastructure just like electricity does. So that is a, a barrier um, to entry, and many countries are facing this the same barrier. Uh, in Canada, we're looking to um, make hydrogen and, and um, uh, export it. But then how we transport across the ocean is uh, a, a tricky technical uh, challenge. Hopefully, we will have a, te uh, a technology solution in a couple of years and be able to address that. Question number two is, does energy infrastructure ready for the usage of green hydrogen? So um, I know in uh, the UK, they're, they're um, injecting hydrogen into um, the natural gas system. You can... Um, there are studies that show you can inject up to 15% hydrogen without needing to change over your um, your uh, fittings, of, uh, like the boilers and the heaters. Uh, hydrogen burns hotter. So um, after that uh, percentage, you do need to change over. But um, it is possible to, uh, many countries are looking into using the existing natural gas uh, infrastructure for hydrogen. But uh, that being said, it's um, it's not a, a straightforward path because hydrogen does cause embrittlement in the um, in the pipes. So um, there is a technical challenges to overcome. Sorry if that was a super long answer for two short questions. I'll open it up to the rest of the um, uh, portfolio. I think they they have some um, some of the energy ladies have uh, more insight uh, than I can provide. Please go ahead. Thank you, Grace. Uh, any more questions? All right, so uh, I think we just have to um, uh, set our meeting uh, to an end. We have one more speaker that's just gonna talk to us uh, outside once he gets here. Um, yeah, I was, I was thinking you would talk longer, so it's, it's, it's been a day. <laughs> But we will talk to her just outside. When we get here, we have some coffee and refreshments outside. Um, so uh, I would just, uh, like I said before, I sincerely hope that this is the first venue of, of many in our collaboration. And I really want to thank uh, Xavier and everybody here, Wire and uh, FKA, for the um, process of getting this together. Uh, I would like to thank all of our speakers and the joint effort of our two collaborations uh, in making this event happen. So thank you so much for coming here and have a great rest of your day. And we have some refreshment outside. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.